Thank you so much for inviting us to speak with you. Um, I'm Jessalyn Radak. I work at the Government Accountability Project, a whistleblower organization in Washington, D.C. So um, I, I myself am a whistleblower, basically. I, during the um, Bush administration, shortly after 9-11, our first capture in the war on terrorism was an American named John Walker Lind, um, and later dubbed to be the American Taliban. And I had advised that during his interrogation, he be allowed to have the lawyer that we, the Justice Department knew had been retained to represent him. Um, that was on a Friday, and then the following Monday, I found out that the FBI had gone ahead and interrogated him without a lawyer. And they were kind of like, oops, what do we do now? And I said, you know, you can still use the information from the interrogation for national security or intelligence gathering purposes, but not for criminal prosecution. And that's exactly what they turned around and did, was attempt to criminally prosecute him. Um, the attorney general went on TV, John Ashcroft had an affinity for these press conferences and wearing makeup, and um, he would go on TV and he said, John Walker Lynn's rights were carefully, scrupulously guarded. I knew that wasn't true because there were pictures of a trophy photo circulating around the world of John Walker Lynn blindfolded, handcuffed, strapped to a board with all sorts of horrible things written all over his body. Um, with a bullet in his leg. It looked very much like the pictures from Abu Ghraib that emerged um, years later. The Attorney General had another press conference and a reporter asked, oh, didn't his family hire an attorney for him? Why was he allowed to see that attorney? And um, Attorney General Ashcroft said, if we knew he had an attorney, he would be allowed to have access to that attorney, which again I knew was a blatant lie. At that point I continued, I mean he was the Attorney General, it was his prerogative to take whatever position he wanted to for the department, so I stayed silent. It was only when I inadvertently learned during the ill-advised criminal prosecution that there had been a federal court order for all interrogation, all Justice Department correspondence related to John Walker Lynn's interrogation. And I knew I had written a couple dozen emails on that. The prosecutor contacted me and said he had two of them and he wanted to make sure he had everything. I knew something was amiss because I didn't know there was a court discovery order. I had not been told. And I knew I'd written far more than two emails. My boss came in and I immediately let her know what was going on. And she said very matter-of-factly that she had sent all the emails in the file. But as a naive 29-year-old, yes, like Snowden, I was 29, like Bradley Manning, I was in my 20s, I, you know, I went up and checked the hard copy. But when I checked the hard copy file, it was completely empty. All my emails were gone, um, except for two very innocuous. I think one said, thank you. I think the other said, some, right. <laughs> exactly. And they had been faxed to the most senior levels of people at the Justice Department. I consulted with a colleague of mine who had been a U.S. attorney for a number of years, um, and he looked at the file with which he was familiar and said very matter-of-factly, this file has been purged, which was just, uh, I mean, for me, the... I just had this horrible, I can't even describe the way my heart dropped. Um, and I knew that this was wrong. I, I ended up calling technical support. This was in the infancy. We had just gotten the internet at the Department of Justice, access to the internet. Um, and I was able to recover um, more than a dozen emails that I had written um, that were pretty incriminating about the ethical um, violation the FBI committed in interrogating him without counsel and parenthetically torturing him. Um, I provided a copy of those emails along with a memo to my boss 
and I resigned, and I took home a copy in case the emails disappeared again. <laughs> so shortly, within a couple months, the criminal trial continued to proceed, and there was going to be a hearing on whether or not Lynn's confession, which was the crux of the case against him, could come in. Um, and it was clear by things that the government was saying that my emails had not, in fact, been turned over to the court. Um, I went to the judge to try to turn over the emails, but I no longer had standing because I had resigned from the department. Um, I ended up giving them to the media. And I thought, okay, weight off my chest. I'd been living with this feeling that, you know, someone could lose their life over the fact that evidence was withheld in the case. Um, I felt relief momentarily, but for me, I didn't realize that in that act of going to a reporter, I had unleashed the full force of the entire executive branch. Over the next four years, I was put under one of the first federal criminal leak investigations. I was referred to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney. That complaint was only resolved this past summer, 10 years later. And I was put on the no-fly list. I thought that was extreme. <laughs> I decided to dedicate the rest of my professional life to representing whistleblowers. I thought what I went through was extreme, that is, until Tom Drake, until I met Tom Drake, because for all the crap I went through, at least I never got indicted. And so when I read that an employee from the National Security Agency had gone through all these channels to blow the whistle on fraud and waste and abuse and then was indicted, and more so was indicted for espionage, I knew something was really wrong. I ended up being an attorney for Tom Drake in his case, which I was hoping was a strange one-off mess up by the Obama administration. And listening, I mean, I happen to have contributed to campaign for and voted for Obama. So before I get shot for being anti-Obama or something, it's not about that. Bush and Obama have been complicit in creating a surveillance state after 9-11. Um, I, I think they share equal blame. But Obama has begun a spate of prosecutions of whistleblowers, hacktivists, and um, basically any form of dissent that reveals um, information that embarrasses the government or exposes its incompetence. And Lord help you, if you expose illegality by the government, you will become the world's most wanted person, as is another client, Edward Snowden. Unfortunately, Tom's case became, he was the first person to be, a non, first non-spy, I should say, to be indicted under the Espionage Act since whistleblower Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, which should tell you something. This is a, a law that is meant to go after spies, not whistleblowers. And it has been used to properly go after people like um, Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen. But this law, meanwhile, has gone after people like Tom Drake, who went through every possible conceivable internal channel at the NSA to blow the whistle, bought his boss, the inspector general, to both houses of Congress, and not only did it not redress his concern, but it turned around and backfired on him and entrapped him, and he was the one who got prosecuted, not the wrongdoers in the NSA. John Kiriakou, another client of mine, is sitting in jail today he is the first CIA officer to have revealed that torture was not a few bad apples going rogue, but rather an official program of the United States government. He was the first CIA agent to confirm waterboarding. Um, he was prosecuted for espionage and for revealing the undercover identity of a torturer. If John Kiriakou had actually tortured somebody, he would not be in jail today. Snowden, as you all know, is another NSA contractor who 
basically provided the documentary evidence about programs on which Tom Drake and a number of his colleagues, whom I also represent, they were blowing the whistles on the embryonic stages of these mass domestic surveillance programs. And without providing the evidence, we would be no better off. And if Snowden had stuck around to go through proper channels, he would be exactly where he is now, under charge by, with the Espionage Act, except he would be in jail and you would not be able to hear from him. I have a feeling he would be in some sort of detention akin to what Bradley Manning had been in for nine months of solitary. Ed Snowden, in fact, had carefully studied, as he said in the Guardian video, had studied the cases of Tom Drake and John Kiriakou and Bradley Manning in deciding how to blow the whistle in a day and age when whistleblowers are reviled by the government, when there is an active campaign to prosecute them as enemies of the state, and when there is no whistleblower protection for national security and intelligence employees, who I would argue are the people you most want to hear from if government wrongdoing is occurring. Unfortunately, we're in a very chilling climate, um, and that is the reason we are going around the country and around the world, in addition to our day jobs, talking to people like you, talking to students, talking to anyone who will listen to help them realize how bad this problem is and that people like myself and like Tom and Edward Snowden are not spies. Um, we're not enemies of the state. We're actually patriotic Americans who feel very passionately about wanting to restore our democracy um, from the surveillance state that it is becoming. So I appreciate you coming out here to hear from us. And I know people have a lot of questions, but I'm going to let Tom go. And then we reserved a lot of time at the end for questions, which tend to be one of the most fruitful parts of what I hope will be in a dialogue. Once again, I find myself uh, with Jesslyn in front of an audience on subjects of significant concern to all of us, not just as Americans, but as citizens. And the first question that I want to ask is, how do you find out what's in the public interest? Ask just, the public. <laughs> just what is the public interest? The reason I ask that question right up front is because the government, since 9-11 in particular, has decided that what is actually in the public interest needs to remain hidden from you. So what happens if you reveal something that truly is in the public interest and the government decides that by revealing that you are a criminal? See, I speak right now as a free human being. Do you know, and I, this is a rhetorical question, but it's important to ask, just what is freedom? What does freedom mean? Saying no to the tyranny of the tyrants. Saying no to the tyranny of the tyrants. You know, we did have an American Revolution a little over two centuries ago. And it was a violent revolution. And those who engaged in the revolution were the terrorists of the day. Lest we forget our own history. I'll have a few more things to say about that here as I unwind for you what's really at stake, not just in this country, but around the world. But we don't, I want to say right up front, this is simply not a litany of all the things that are bad with the government. The real ultimate question is, is what are we going to do about it as the people? We, the people. Because ultimately, we're the ones that are responsible. It's easy to sit back and blame the government. It's easy to sit back and throw stones. It's easy to sit back and say, hey, it's all messed up. There's nothing we can do. Or if we try to do something, nothing happens. You're looking at two people who took oaths to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. 
That oath is to an idea of how to govern ourselves. And although it has many faults and a whole lot of contradictions were built into it from the get-go, it's a grand experiment in how do we best govern ourselves as a constitutional republic. We, and I would strongly suggest that the vast majority of Americans, when placing their own history into the proper context, don't want to see that grand experiment disappear. Because if the grand experiment disappears, then what are we left with? It's a fundamental question. So what is in the public interest? You see a cue on my lapel. That cue stands for question everything. Question everything but especially authority. Especially authority. The Snowden disclosures since June, which have been extraordinary, none of them have surprised me. I'm actually well aware of most of those disclosures in terms of earlier history. I was there from the very beginning of those programs. I myself blew the whistle any number of the foundational programs that metastasized over the next dozen years. I've been reliving the past 12 years as a result of the Snowden disclosures. We're finally having the debate. We're actually finally having the conversation. And not, it wasn't just ignited domestically. There's been extraordinary conversation, discussion, debate overseas and internationally. But lest we forget history. Anybody remember Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> Discovered lightning, right? Did you know that one could argue that in terms of American history, at least the history we know through what's published, that he's the first whistleblower? And he paid an extraordinarily high price at that time for blowing the whistle. Anybody have a clue as to what he blew the whistle on? Anybody remember that he was a postmaster general? One of the colonies at the time named Massachusetts. And there was a governor over that colony. Let's just say that, that back in those days, that the Postmaster General had access to a lot of communication that was going back and forth. Sound familiar? <laughs> and there was a letter that was transmitted from the Crown to the governor of Massachusetts. And let's just say that Benjamin Franklin intercepted that letter, and discovered that in that letter that the rights that were accorded the, those that fell under the British crown would not extend to those colonists across the ocean. He disclosed that fact, and guess what happened? He got fired. I just, a little bit of history. What happens when you question authority? What happens when you disclose something in the public interest? You think that his disclosure was in the colonists' interest? That their rights did not extend? Those rights that the British citizens had did not extend to the colonists? They were just subjects of the crown. I mention this because we find ourselves in interesting times since 9-11 regarding our own rights under the Constitution. And a government who apparently has decided, particularly since 9-11, that maybe those rights are fungible. Fungible. Maybe those rights aren't really sacrosanct. Maybe those rights, well, they don't really matter as much when it's our job to, quote unquote, defend the homeland and provide for your security. Just maybe. One of the things that we also need to remember, and I'm going back here for a few minutes to history, because one could argue, and I consider myself a student of politics and history, and clearly both of us 
here on st up on stage are more than just footnotes in history. One could argue that the reason we even had an American Revolution was because of the egregious violations, the usurpations that were engaged in by the crown against the colonists with respect to first and what became known as the First and Fourth Amendment. But in particular, the Fourth Amendment, which, by the way, was actually followed after the original Constitution was ratified because people were really concerned that the rights weren't actually enumerated in the Constitution. There was a thing called a writ of assistance. A writ of assistance, piece of paper, British officer, you know, it could just show up at your door. That writ of assistance was literally just a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, they could search anything you had. They could even take you away. It didn't matter what your rights were. They could just do it. It was one of the primary reasons why we even had an American Revolution. And so I'm reminded once again, as I look back on the past 12 years and the extraordinary ordeal that I went through and the fact that I now can share this as a free human being, when at one point during the government's investigation of me in 2008, the original chief prosecutor actually said, Mr. Drake, this is five months after the FBI had raided me so unceremoniously in November of 2007, tossing my house, taking all kinds of papers and effects away because I was a really, really bad guy. They had their writ of assistance. They had managed to convince a magistrate judge that there was probable cause evidence that I was engaged in activity against the United States of America, that I was a danger to national security. That chief prosecutor said, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison, Mr. Drake? I'm going to pause. Imagine what we like to spend the rest of your life in prison unless you cooperate with our investigation. And I told him then, and I kept telling him for the next number of years, I will not plea bargain with the truth. See, in the preamble of the Constitution, it says, we the people. We the people, doesn't say those of us in power, doesn't say the current politicians, and if I extrapolate, didn't say NSA or the president, it said we the people. We the people what? <laughs> we the people in order to form a more perfect union. But there's something else in the preamble that people forget. And this is crucial to understanding what's at stake. And all the excuses and the ends justifying the means that was so triggered in such an extraordinary way in the deepest of secrecy at the highest levels of our government after 9-11. Two primary responsibilities of government. Provide for the common defense and the general welfare. The United States government utterly failed to protect the nation on 9-11. It did not keep people out of harm's way. It failed the nation. But I guess the government was too big to fail. And so decisions were made in the deepest of secrecy that because of 9-11, we're going to take that line, that artificial false dichotomy line, between liberty and security, and we're going to draw it, move it, slide it way over to the security side. Remember Benjamin Franklin? Said something about those who would seek a little safety? How can you forsake the fundamental basis for your own governance, your own freedoms, your own rights, and your own liberties for the sake of security? If Benjamin Franklin had anything to say on this score, you're going to lose both. 
I took an oath four times in my government career to support and defend an idea. I didn't take an oath to the president. I didn't take an oath to NSA. I did not take an oath to secrecy. Even JFK said that secrecy is repugnant in an open and transparent society, paraphrasing. Repugnant. But apparently in order to defend us, the government has to be really secret. Remember, public interest. So I asked the question early on, what is freedom? Look, I faced 35 years after they finally figured out a way to indict me, 10 felony count indictment, five under the Espionage Act, an act that was actually a World War I era statute designed to go after real spies and not whistleblowers, but I've been turned into a spy. In fact, the government argued that, although they, they did their best to avoid ever using the word whistleblower, in fact, they filed formal motions to eliminate as admissible and relevant if I had gone to public trial any, any of the history of my whistleblowing, any reference to any and all First Amendment activities involving the press under the First Amendment, by the way, which is protected, and any reference to classification, including the executive branch's own classification system, in which they were in egregious violation of. I took an oath. I took that oath to the idea and became criminalized. Do you know what it's like to face the prospect of having everything you spent most of your adult life defending taken away from you? I'm just asking you for a moment to put yourself in my place. Because once I was indicted, I faced the distinct prospect that everything that I had spent most of my adult life defending, the idea of how to govern ourselves, those extraordinary rights in the Bill of Rights, I face a distinct prospect that I would have those taken away from me as a sovereign individual under natural law. For 14 months, let's just say I was a little bit focused on keeping those freedoms. And with the extraordinary leadership of Justin Radak defending me in the court of public opinion and my criminal defense attorneys defending me in the federal district court in Baltimore, I managed to keep the government at bay. And I was able to keep my freedoms. I was able to keep my liberties. But they had confiscated my passport. They had put me under severe travel restrictions. I couldn't leave the local area without the permission of the court. And the government had the right of first refusal. In fact, the government made the argument during my arraignment, after my private personal attorney had thought I was arrested, but during the arraignment, after I was booked and, you know, you got my mug shot, the government actually argued before the judge that I was a flight risk. A flight risk. Yeah, I was, I was a super spy. I grew up in Texas and Vermont. I grew up in a state, two states, that were republics before they became states. I recognize that my own background does provide context in why freedom and liberty is so important and why you can never, ever, ever, ever take it for granted. In Vermont, where I spent most of my youth growing up, there's a thing called the Vermont Town Meeting, an extraordinary manifestation of democracy in action. Every year, during mud season, maple syrup, a few last winter snows, the town meets as one. 
There was no conditions or restrictions on who could get up and speak their mind. Everybody had a chance once a year to say their piece. The conscience of the town where I grew up in Wells, Vermont, was Fred Cooper. Fred Cooper was an old, true Vermonter. He was the conscience of the town. He reminded people of who we were. He was irascible. He was hard to get along with. You could hardly understand him because he had the real Vermont drawl. But every time he stood up at town meeting, everybody listened to him. Because if you didn't listen to Fred Cooper, one, he'd be on you during the rest of the year. And two, he had the uncanny ability to say what needed to be said in terms of what was in our own interests as a town. And it could be little things that were wrong or things that were right that needed to be emphasized. It was always Fred Cooper who had that voice. You see, on 9-11... I started at NSA, my first day on the job. I never imagined, due to the horrors of 9-11 and 3,000 people being murdered, recognizing that day as those that I worked with, most of the people I worked with realized we had utterly failed the nation. What was the fundamental responsibility of the government? We were in the secret side of the government. We were supposed to provide indications and warning. Remember Paul Revere? We had failed the nation. What I didn't know at that time is that very quickly in those days and weeks after 9-11, in the deepest of secrecy, the government literally unchained itself from the very constitution I had taken an oath to support and defend. Now, am I a witness to this? I have secret knowledge that the White House has approved a mass surveillance program. And in fact, when I confronted the lead attorney in the Office of General Counsel the first week in October of 2001, I did not know that Bush had just signed an executive order authorizing NSA to turn the United States in the equivalent of a foreign nation for the purpose of dragnet electronic surveillance on an extraordinarily vast scale. And I knew that was my moment of truth. I'd already discovered a lot of other things. That was my moment of truth. And I recognized that if I remained silent, I would be complicit in a crime. I recognized that if I remained silent, that I would be violating the oath that I had taken now for the fourth time. The horror of recognizing out of the horror of 9-11 that my own government in the deepest of secrecy, that the White House had approved a program when I questioned them, questioned them, they said, you don't understand, Mr. Drake. It's all legal. We are the executive agent. And I knew in that moment I was thrown back to the 1970s as a very young adult with Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers and Watergate ultimately resulting in a president resigning his office. Go back and read the articles of impeachment that were drawn up by the House of Representatives. They're chilling in terms of the abuse of instruments of national power against American citizens. And yet the world in which it was born in secret unchaining itself, the government changed all the Constitution, makes the Nixon era look like pikers. But you have to remember something about NSA. You tell me, you, you ask, you tell me, I'm asking, any government agency or department that was not brought into being through legislation, okay? Name me one that wasn't. Guess what? NSA was. Secret executive order. CIA, I heard someone whisper, came into being under the National Security Act of 1947. 
not NSA. NSA was simply by executive decree, President Truman's pen created NSA. Go back and read about Operation Shamrock, Operation Minaret, and a host of other programs that most people forget about in terms of NSA violating the rights of U.S. citizens. There is a history here that is dark. There is a history here that is not pleasant. So, I pause for the moment because I'm going to ask you a question. If the government just thinks that in order to protect the homeland and provide for the national security of the country, that if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. Guess what the assumption is in that statement? There is no privacy. There is no privacy. And you know where that statement came from? Go back to the Nazi era, the Goebbels. That's who actually uttered those words. That's dark history. But continue, I continue to hear that. And so I'm going, to, I was, I'm going to indulge you all in an exercise right now. Because I think it's going to bring home why it's so important to understand that you cannot have a secret government eroding your liberties and your rights, forsaking them for the sake of security. So, here we go. I'm indulging. I want you to give me all of the keys to your cars. I want you to give me all the keys to your house and all your lock boxes at the bank. I want you to give me every password you have for every account that, that exists in your name. All your health records, all your bank statements, all your telephone records, all your credit card information. I want you to put it into a box. Okay, put it in a box. And you're just going to give it to me for safekeeping. <laughs> Would you do it? No. Now, every time I've run this exercise in small and large audiences, no one has said yes. There was a person being cute who said maybe in California. <laughs> Why not? That's good. <laughs> so they have a copy of it. Yeah, that's backup. Always have backups. It's your right. Mm. It's your right. Interesting to say it that way. It's your right. No one. But look, if you have nothing to hide, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? Look, I'm an American citizen. This is, this is a contract by consent. It's a social contract you're entering into with me. You see who I am, and you're saying no. You don't trust me as an American? Well, what if I can see all of your records? Uh, <laughs> it's none of their business. Well, you have nothing to hide. If you have nothing to hide, then you know, I'm the government. I'm the government. But this is the argument that's been made in all kinds of various ways. We either we need all access to everything there is just in case. We need the haystack because we don't know where the needle is. Except the last time I checked, remember where I grew up? I grew up on a 110-acre farm in Vermont. We had cows and chickens and horses. We had hay that we fed them in the wintertime. How do you make hay? Look, if I take all, if I take all the grass and cut it, cut it down, but gee, every, all, all, every little straw might be, be a needle, and I keep adding to the pile in the barn, where's the needle? 
Where is the needle? But you have nothing to hide. So what's the problem? You don't trust me. So if that's the case, why would you trust a government doing so without your consent? What form of government is that? I'm not going to answer the question right now. <laughs> How much liberty do we sacrifice? See, the thing we face right now is a zero-sum game. It's like all or nothing. You want perfect security? Guess what? Everybody read 1984? That book, Aldous Huxley's book, you know, I never imagined. I just didn't. As even as I sit here now, it's still surreal for me. It is surreal. I'm fortunate I'm not in a prison. I'm fortunate that I have a voice. I'm fortunate that Justin Raddick gave me a voice when I had none during those 14 months, facing the prospect of going to prison for 35 years. Perfect security. You know, Winston, guess where Winston had to go to have any privacy at all? And I put privacy in quotes. Do you know where he went? Cowering in the corner. It was the only place where the ubiquitous surveillance cameras couldn't see him, which meant they knew where he was. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. But hey, you know, this is not the threat of a nuclear winter, is it? What's the problem? You know? Oh, wow. Zero sum game. So, what happens in a country where those who disclose information in the public interest, otherwise known as whistleblowers, are criminalized? What kind of message does that send? What if the people in the town, the town of Wells, Vermont, had told Fred to shut up and sit down? What does that create? chilling effect. Remember that thing called the First Amendment? The right to assemble, associate freely with others, free press, redress of grievances against your own government? Does that matter? Does it matter? Does it matter? Hey, but I guess capital S state takes priority over the sovereignty of the individual. That somehow the state is superior. State can take away your rights and your freedoms at any time. Well, look, they declare me an enemy of the state. You know what it's like to be declared an enemy of the state? You know what it's like to be labeled a Benedict Arnold? You were once one of us, now you're one of them. You're a turncoat traitor. The government actually made the case. You want to understand Edward Snowden? You want to understand all of the extraordinary war on whistleblowing, which ultimately is a war on journalists and the First Amendment. The information is the currency of power. You understand? Go read my case. And you know about most of the case is sealed. There's an extraordinary amount of documents that were filed in my case. Public record. Stephen Affergood's website. This project on secrecy has most of them. Not all, but most that were actually made available publicly in terms of their filings. During the course of my pretrial proceedings, the government actually said that what I did before the judge was worse than spying. That what I did led to information disclosed to those not authorized to receive it. And that meant everybody saw it, including the spies. And it's worse than spying because at least when you spy, like Alger Hiss or Alger James or Robert Hansen, the public doesn't hear about it because it's shared in secret. Oh, wow. Yeah. Look, I recognize, and we're going to open up for Q&A here in a couple minutes. I recognize that I'm an extraordinarily fortunate American human being. But I'm not going to shut up. And I'm not going to sit down. What was your
your impression of the attitude of your former co-workers toward illegal government activities in general? And another right. asks whether the people who accused you, whether you think they sincerely believed you were a spy or they were simply trying to cover up bad behavior. And then more generally, is there a sense in which all employees of the NSA are complicit? <laughs> The last question, no. This program, the Secret Surveillance Program, even some of the details about the, and I didn't even go into it, the intelligence failures. NSA had critical intelligence. It was never shared with national command authorities, let alone others, for action. I'll give you one example. I'm going to say it here publicly um, because there's things that have come out in the press, although I've talked about it in the past. Um, NSA had the numbers. You know, they've talked about, well, if we had the secret surveillance program before 9-11, we could have stopped 9-11. And they argue that we didn't know about the phone numbers of the terrorists that were in the United States contacting the Yemeni safe house in Yemen. That's absol an absolute lie. It's a lie. I gave the prima facie evidence to congressional 9-11 investigators. Okay. You tell me. What did they cover up? So most didn't know. The vast majority of people at NSA were not aware of the secret surveillance programs, were not aware of the intelligence failures, they weren't aware of the cover-up. I mean, some people give NSA far more power uh, than they deserve. <laughs> uh, but there, you know, they're a very large secret intelligence uh, agency with, with an enormous budget. And I will tell you, 9-11, the vast majority of the workforce took it really hard. They realized that we had failed the nation. But my immediate supervisor said, no, 9-11 is a gift to NSA. We're going to get all the money we want and then some. You have to remember, there's a huge elephant in the room here. I'm just going to take the opportunity to mention it. Huge elephant in the room. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. And I, some people say, well, you know, we got to keep talking about this. I don't know. I use pretty strong language. <laughs> The U.S. government sold out our national security, sold out to the highest bidder. The military-industrial complex it was Eisenhower warned us about. Look, I know many, many people at NSA as contractors and those at Revolving Door who became multimillionaires as a result of 9-11. I give people their due, but on the backs of national security, on the backs of the enormous, enormous redistribution of wealth that went for what? Two wars? Secret wars we haven't even heard about yet? All the Homeland Security, for what? We're the, declaring the, the globe a, a, a battlefield everywhere, including the United States? What? So no, NS, you know, the people at NSA are complicit. You have this interesting dynamic. I've spoken at length with, with Ellsberg about this. He actually thought that more people, when he blew the whistle on Vietnam, the dark and shining lie, or some would say the bright and shining lie of Vietnam, and a book was written about that, he thought more people would come forward. People don't realize he actually blew the whistle through multiple channels in his time. And no one would listen. Everybody remained silent. The only people that came forward were his media associates. And look what happened to Ellsberg. He faced 115 years and actually did go to trial. And the only reason it got tossed, although the government, because the government was actually losing their case, as it turns out, over the course of the previous two years, is because he decided to breach the office of his psychologist, looking for dirt. And I can't talk about it in detail here, but they did the same thing with me. Okay, When their case was collapsing in the courtroom, they decided to go personal. Well, what does that tell you? But here's the thing. People have, have told me in private, people I used to work with, we understand why you blew the whistle, Tom, but I wouldn't do it. Look what happened to you. And others have said, I wouldn't have said anything to nobody. You know, that see something, say something. So if you see something illegal, if you see government wrongdoing, if you see threats to public safety, meaning intelligence, that actually can be used, not just warn the nation, but keep people out of harm's way, and it's not being done, and you remain silent, you tell me. But most people don't say anything. Most people remain silent. If silence is complicit, then yes. 
but here's what people tell me. And this is fundamental here. It's, remember, ultimately it's about us as the people. It's, it's what kind of future do you want to keep? Do you want to continue the grand experiment? Does it matter to us? Well, Tom, I, I don't want to lose my pension. I don't want to lose my job. Uh, I have a mortgage. I've got kids in college. I want to keep my job. Remember, how high a price will you pay for liberty and freedom? I would just add that Edward Snowden saw something and said something. Um, I would also add that there are some 40,000 people who work for NSA, and Tom is married to one of them, and my client Bill Binney is married to one of them. He's also NSA. John Kiriakou, who worked for the CIA, was also married, and is still is married, to the same person who at the time was also with the CIA. We don't think all people who work for government agencies are bad. I think there are a number of people at the top who frankly should be in jail, who have the full knowledge of what's going on, and it is a mystery to me why another whistleblower, Stephen Kim, yesterday was sentenced to 13 months in jail um, for revealing basically that in response to UN um, sanctions, North Korea might launch another nuclear test information that was common knowledge. Why he's going to jail and people like James Clapper, who lied to Congress under oath, on camera, in public, is not going to jail, and why the, the cabal of people like Michael Hayden and Brennan and Clapper, why do those people still have their jobs when people like Tom Drake have been fired, and more than fired, prosecuted, and lost everything, drained his retirement account, his pension gone, got a second mortgage on the house, they, for whistleblowers, they will bankrupt you, blacklist you, and leave you broken. And meanwhile, these people in positions of power commit unfettered crime and have the audacity to stay. And more than that, the president lets them. So we're in a very different era right now. People say, well, if you know Snowden, they make comparisons to Ellsberg. Well, Ellsberg stayed and faced trial. Well, Ellsberg himself said it was a very different America back then than it is today. And daily we have to deal with the fear-mongering of the government about the next terrorist attack, whether it's going to be at the Olympics or on our own soil. And every time they say that Snowden's going to have the the blood of Americans on his hands. I remind you that they said the exact same thing about Tom Drake, literally that soldiers would die because NSA would go dark because of what Tom Drake did. The fear mongering keeps us silent. And when you hear the government trying to make you scared, that's when I urge you to actually speak up and not buy into that. It really is a false dichotomy to say that liberty and security are in tension with one another. That's simply not true. Nor are they mutually exclusive. To the toothpaste, to the White House. <laughs> if your government can act in secret, it can do anything. How is that different from a dictatorship? It isn't. <laughs> I have said, I'll say it again. No, it isn't. We have, we have the equivalent of virtual tyranny already. One of my colleagues, Bill Binney, a fellow NSA whistleblower, has said we have, we're this close, this far away from turnkey tyranny. What's the difference? I've said that we have a digital fence all around us already. Look, people in this, remember, I gave a, I gave a talk. And I know I disturbed a lot of people in the audience. It was a Web 2.0 summit out at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco a couple of years ago. And you had all the internet and web elites there. And I know I made people really uncomfortable because I said I was challenging them. You know, it's one thing to make money off your subscribers. It's one thing to monetize their information. But they do so by consent. 
They do so with terms and conditions. It's a whole nother thing for some of you to make a profit by selling it to the government in secret. So the government can find out more about their, their citizens than even you do by combining with lots of other information. There are a lot of people that were uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. They get, they get the profit both ways. Now you what is it, corporations? Why? Because you're just, you can monetize your privacy. Remember, privacy is worth a lot of money. But at least with a corporation, it's by consent. You can choose to go to another, another company or another, you can. With the government, the government has the ability right now, and I believe there's still more disclosures to come. As many as you've seen so far, they can build a profile of you at any time. Look, during, during the period in which I was monitoring, surveilling, at the state level, East Germany, the Stasi had these incredibly efficient record system, these massive files on every single person and then some. They had this enormous in, this indexing scheme that allowed them to look up and cross-reference, all manual. This is the digital world. Do you know how easy it is to fire off a query? Just Google yourself and find out a whole lot about you, right? And of course, Google is tracking what you're finding out about you. <laughs> it's, part of this is surreal for me. It just is surreal. I mean, part of it is you have to laugh about this. And why? the other thing is really serious.